reduce mind to matter. That's putting it. If you cannot. If you cannot do that, if it's not reducible to matter, then evolutionary naturalism collapses because it's it's materialistic to the core. In other words, there's something very, very wrong with this materialistic view. Now, I now go further than that. I say, look, we are in the information age. Information is usually carried on material. Information is not material. It's immaterial. Now, here's a this, wonderful thing. This is another huge idea. It is. Information is immaterial. Yes. So if all you believe in is the material universe, information itself doesn't right. make sense. It doesn't make sense. Yes, absolutely. You'll have, you, you, sense. But you'll have to explain how information is immaterial. Well, suppose I want to carry a message. I'm sitting on top of a mountain in Washington State my favorite mountain up there with the snow on it. Do you know that mountain? I do. And I'm Rain, sitting up rainier. the radio. So I, I make smoke signals. And up they go into the air. And they're seen by some Indians 20 miles away. But they're more intelligent than me. So they've got a telephone. So they pick up the telephone. They convey the information to somebody else who uh, types it on the internet. And it's received in Oxford. The information that's received in Oxford is not material. Material things have been used to get it there, but it itself is not material. And this gives people great difficulty. But is the idea behind that, if my eyes read letters on a wall, I'm reading a sign, yes. the letters on the sign are material. Yes. I am material. Yes. But what I gather from the letters... The is concept not, is not It's not reducible on any level to the material. No. Uh, in other words, it's not as if something has been beamed into my brain. My eyes can look at the shapes, but turning it into information is somehow immaterial. Let me illustrate this with what actually has happened to me several times. I'm sitting at dinner. And we have lovely dinners at Oxford, you know, in our college. And the seat placings are fixed. And one night, I found myself beside a very eminent biochemist. And unfortunately, he asked me what I did. And I said, I'm a pure mathematician. And he said, how dreadfully boring. And he meant it. He meant it. He said that. Yes, he said that. How dreadfully boring. And... Uh, I saw that this was going to be a bit of a, a social disaster. So I said, but don't worry about that. I know my subject is quite unsociable and complicated. So I tried to make up for that by being interested in the big questions. He said, what big questions? Well, I said, like, the status of the universe. Is it created or not? He said, stop. It's far worse than I thought. He said, listen, I'm an atheist. I'm a reductionist. And we have nothing to talk about, and we're going to have a miserable dinner. Well, that was a challenge for an Irishman. <laughs> so I looked at him, and I said, I, with a great grin, because I grin, you know, when I'm panicking. I, a great grin, I say to him, no, we're going to have a marvelously interesting evening. He said, why is that? And I said, I'm fascinated by reductionism. I know at least three kinds. Which kind are you? <laughs> well, that was a bit difficult. So I helped him out because I'm also quite a kind, friendly Irishman. You're very generous. So I said to him, look, you got a problem. I got a problem. You and biochemistry, me and mathematics, we split it up into little problems. Try and solve them. Get insight on the big problem. He said, I do that. I said, I do that. That's methodological reductionism. I said, we both do that. So we have something to talk about. But he said, I'm not that kind of reductionism. A reductionist. I said, I know you're not. You are an ontological reductionist. Ontos, Greek for being. You believe everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. He said, exactly. And that's why we have nothing to talk about. I said, we have. Why don't we do an experiment? He said, what? I said, you heard me. Why don't we do an experiment? <laughs> but he says, this is dinner. I said, yes, but it's Oxford. And, 
He said, what's the experiment? I picked up the menu. And he said, what's the problem with the menu? Roast chicken. I said, that's the problem. For you, not for me. He said, why? I said, R O A S T. Those are marks on paper. Yes, they are, but they say roast chicken. I said, how do you know? Well, he said, I've learned English. Oh, he said, that's very interesting. You learned English, and you give those marks a meaning, and you're a reductionist. Everything physics and chemistry. I said, okay, you explain to me how those marks convey the idea of roast chicken and just use the material of the paper and ink. Dead silence. This is a deep, this is maybe not for you, but for most of us, this is a very uh, deep, or as we say, heavy idea. Uh, it's at the heart of everything. Yes, but I've never heard, to answer your question. But I've never heard anyone but you uh, talk about this issue. And I was hoping you'd bring, bring it up or we would come to it. Yes. This, this is a fascinating yes. idea. And it, it goes to the heart of all we've been discussing so far about the mind and material. He looked at it. And <laughs> it was very funny, actually. I must say this, because his wife was there. And she said, and she said it too loudly, she said, get out of that if you can. <laughs> but what was amazing, he did not try. After a minute or so, he said, it cannot be done. He was sharp enough to see that. But it was devastating. And for a man of his <laughs> he said, John, now he's getting friendly. I have been going to my laboratory for 40 years thinking that could be done. 40 years. So he saw, he saw through it. That. He saw through it. Oh. Like that. Like a flash. And I tried to play devil's advocate, which I can be reasonably good at. And I said, but physics and chemistry, properly spoken, have only been going five or six hundred years. He said, it doesn't matter. You must have a mind. And he got it, you see. And this is what we're about. That the moment you see language, and this is where I want to blow a hole in the popular conception that all explanation goes from the simple to the complex. It's reductionist. Dawkins wants to explain elephants, as he says, in terms of the bits and pieces that physicists work on. I say that's marvelous where it works, and it does work. We can split water into hydrogen and oxygen and so on, but where it doesn't work, where I want to say it never works, is where language is involved. Now, the interesting thing is this. Here's a man who works on DNA. So, I say, look, R-O-A-S-T, R-O-A-S-T is five letters. You saw those five letters and you immediately postulated the mind. Now tell me about DNA, which is 3.5 billion letters. All of the right letters, of course, in the chemical yeah. alphabet, but yeah. they code. We talk about the genetic code and we're not embarrassed about it. So it's semiotic. It indicates it's a sign, semi-on, a sign. It indicates something that is meaning. What about that? Oh, he said, that's chance and the laws of nature. I said, come on. R-O-A-S-T, mind. 3.5 billion letters in the right order and the longest word we've ever discovered, no mind. There's something odd going on. Mm -hmm. And I want to maintain that Nagel is right. He's onto something. And it'll be very interesting to see how that thinking develops. One of the most powerful evidences to my mind that there is a an eternal mind behind the universe is first of all that we can do science that we can do it in the language of mathematics that we have language that we can use we can use abstract con concepts that are not material to describe things that are physical all of that points in one direction and one direction only and it's this in the beginning was the word not the particles <laughs>